the University Press of Kentucky. And she in turn will introduce you to two of the University Press authors, uh, Eric Jackson and Frank X. Walker. She'll tell you, talk a little bit about her collaboration with Eric and Frank. Uh, but I'd like to remind you that the Clark, the Clark Foundation's collaboration with Ashley and the University Press, our foundation exists uh, or has existed up until now uh, to support the, pre the work of the press, which is to publish Kentucky scholarship. But I can tell you that the, the members of the Clark Foundation are proud to be associated with, with uh, the University Press because of its longtime commitment to scholarship about civil rights and black history and culture. I'll let Ashley tell you more about her work. Ashley. Thanks, Benny, so much. Um, I'm Ashley Runyon. I'm the director of the University Press of Kentucky, um, and we are the state publisher for the state. Our mission is the publication of academic books um, that includes a lot of high of scholarly merit in a variety of fields, as well as publication of books about the history and culture of Kentucky and the Appalachian region. Um, one misconception about the press is that it is just the University of Kentucky. And while we are housed on the campus of the University of Kentucky, we are a consortium of all the public colleges and universities in the state, um, as well as six of the private colleges and universities and two historical societies. That's the Filson Historical Society and the Kentucky Historical Society. So we really are a, a statewide a press. We really do want to support the entire mission of education across the state of Kentucky. Um, Benny talked a little bit about our relationship with the Clark Foundation. Um, the Clark Foundation supports the mission of the press and its, and its content. We are so thankful to have their support. Um, in addition to supporting our overall mission, the Clark Foundation also awards the Clark Medallion Book Award each year. And that, that represents the book that best represents Dr. Clark's dedication to Kentucky history, heritage, and culture. Um, past awards have gone to many terrific books, uh, including Violence Against Women in Kentucky, Writing Appalachia, an anthology that featured the work of many, numerous um, Black and Indigenous people of color throughout the last four centuries. Um, it also included slaves, slaveholders, and uh, Kentucky community struggle toward freedom. And then, of course, the award-winning um, the Kentucky African American Encyclopedia. That encyclopedia was a decade in the making um, and the first of its kind nationally and one that we've been very proud of um, at the press for quite some time. So as, as we might um, assume right here, um, you know, we have many titles about Kentucky and Appalachia. Um, many of those are very scholarly. They're really geared toward an academic market. Um, they profile the history and culture of the region. But we also have a wide range of general interest titles. Um, since it is Kentucky, we have horses, basketball, and bourbon, um, you know, kind of the big things that we're known about in the state. Um, we also do some travel books as well. And so those are the, the areas that people really associate with us, Kentucky and Appalachia. Um, but we do have some areas that might be a surprise to some folks. Um, film biographies is one area that we do really well in and is a surprise to most people. Um, and then a big area for us for many decades has been civil rights. Um, key to that is our civil rights and the struggle for black equality series that has included, um, you know, many high profile books. It includes the memoir of civil rights legend Bernard Lafayette, uh, biographies of civil rights leaders um, Fannie Lou Hamer, who was mentioned previously, um, during David Child's um, talk, um, profiles of Roy Wilkins, um, Gloria Richardson, and then we also have political companions of, of Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, and, and Richard Wright. And then last year, um, our book on John, Her John Herbie Wheeler um, and Black Banking um, won the prestigious Lillian Smith Book Award. And that is a national book award um, given to the book that best signifies a racially just society. That was the first time that we've won um, that award. It is a large national award. And I think it speaks to um, not both the, all the, the quantity of our civil rights um, titles, but obviously the quality of those as well. So regionally, um, we're also known for many of our, our Black and civil rights nonfiction titles. That includes um, Civil Rights and the Gateway to the South. Um, that's Tracy K. Myers' Important History of Louisville and, and how it really was influential on the civil rights struggle um, nationally. We also have many other books, um, you know, Blacks in Appalachia, History of Blacks in Kentucky. This is not a flash in the pan for us. This is something that we have been working on um, and promoting as part of our signature list for quite some time. 
In addition to really talking about um, stories of diverse regional fixtures, figures, we also want to showcase the voices of Black, Indigenous, people of color, and other marginalized voices. This last fall, our two lead titles um, included Randall Horton. He was a Black poet who detailed his experience in prison and then the discrimination that he received after. It's a, an extremely powerful poetry collection and got a, a lot of attention, as well as a, a Nooks and a Clap Saddle. Um, she is the first published member of the Eastern Band of Cherokees and um, that book got a lot of attention including being on the NPR's best books of 2020 list. In this year, coming in 2021, um, we're privileged to have several award-winning authors. Um, first of is being Crystal Wilkinson, who is, you know, a staple figure in, in the Kentucky world. Um, she is the Ernest G. Gaines award-winning author, um, The Birds of Opulence, which was just selected as the Kentucky Reads selection for 2021 by Kentucky Humanities. And we're really excited to be partnering with her on her new poetry collection, Perfect Black. Um, this year, I'm also thrilled um, to, be on, to be working with National Book Award winner Nikki Finney. Um, we're doing a new edition of her Heartwood. And as the state publisher of Kentucky, it is really important at the press that not only are we publishing these important and diverse voices, but that people are able to read them. Um, you know, in our state, there's a lot of folks who want to have this material, but the truth is they can't afford it. Um, so this year, what we did, um, we want to make sure that that content is readily available to students, staff, and faculty across the state, regardless of their, their financial situation. So in 2020, we opened up more than 1,250 titles, free and available to all our consortium partners. That means that anyone um, at any of the colleges and universities in the state have free digital access to more than 1,200 titles of our backlist. And today and in the coming year, um, we're also excited to open up these same resources to any public schools um, attending this seminar. Um, you might have seen on the website for the seminar, which is historyofrace.com, and under resources, you'll find a little bit more information um, about the press, including how you can sign up for these materials materials for your school. We're also going to be signing up um, some additional information in a forthcoming email. Um, so please feel free to, to reach out to me and my team if you'd like your, your school to be um, included in that partnership. Um, we want to make sure that all Kentucky students um, are able to have this material. It's our mission not just to publish the material, but have it available for people to be able to read. And so with that, I do want to introduce our, our first speaker for today. Um, th this is going to be Eric Jackson. Um, he is a professor of Black Studies at Northern Kentucky University. With almost 25 years of academic experience at the university level, um, Dr. Jackson teaches in the fields of American and African American history, race relations, as well as peace studies. Um, he has over 50 publications, including journals um, Africology, the Journal of Pan American Studies, Studies in the Journal of African American History. Um, he recently award, was awarded two awards for his community outreach work. I'm also um, very privileged to introduce um, Eric as we are working with him on the most comprehensive introduction to Black Studies textbook on the market. Um, this has been a collaboration sometime um, in, in the making. I do want to thank specifically um, Northern Kentucky University as well as the Clark Foundation um, you know, for all of their help um, working with that in terms of a fundraising and being able to, to fund the publication of that book. And then finally, I, I, I wouldn't be here and all of us wouldn't be here without the Clark Foundation. Um, they are so crucial um, to, to the mission of the press. So I want to thank all of the, the members of, of the board there, um, as well as specifically Mark Nykirk and Vinnie Ivory. Without them um, and their work behind the scenes, this wouldn't happen. So um, Eric, uh, I'm going to open up the floor to you. Um, and I, and I want to hear all of the great things that you're doing. And thank you all so much for having us. I want to thank Ashley and um, uh, University Press of Kentucky, my editor, Natalie O'Neill. Um, I think this will be the first uh, comprehensive textbook published by the University of the University Press of Kentucky. It should be out in late 2020, uh, 2022, 2023, I think. I think it's what we're working on. It's an introduction to Black Studies textbook, which is different than just Black history. Black came out of the 1960s. It has eight disciplines, including history, sociology, psychology, education, politics, Black feminism, religion, and the arts. The arts, including literature, music, and visual performance art, visual and performance art. Um, it is as comprehensive as possible. 
my um, conceptualization of this textbook was to have it reach uh, survey level students in college, but also high school uh, levels. Um, so that's my goal of getting this textbook out. And again, I wanna thank the press, Clark Foundation, all the folks that Ashley mentioned in her remarks of helping me move this great volume to the forefront. So now I'll hand it over to Frank. Let me, um, actually, I'm going to introduce Frank, oh, um, and he's on here too. So um, Frank, very, very nice to have you. Um, Frank X. Walker, who we, who we saw in the very powerful video right before we started talking, um, is a professor of African American and Africana Studies at the University of Kentucky, where he is also the director of the MFA program. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the prestigious NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work in Poetry. Congrats, Frank, that's amazing. Um, he is the the author and editor of many works, um, the editor of America, What's My Name, The Other, Unfurl the Flag, and Afrolatcha. Um, the press was privileged to publish two of his poetry collections, When Winter Come, The Ascension of York, and Buffalo Dance, The Journey of York. Um, I'm also very pleased to announce that we are partnering um, with Frank and illustrator Ron Davis um, on a children's book, A is for Afrolatcha, which is set to be released next year. So um, welcome, Frank. It's great to have you. Great to be here. Um, I guess I'm just saying hello. I think my part starts at 1230. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> I think we have Eric back on here too. Hi, Ashley, I'm still here. Hi, um, I think we're, we're, we're waiting for Frank to come on at 12.30. We were doing an introduction for okay. him, so. We can, we can still talk. Uh, I can talk about more of the press itself. I mean, I've been connected to the press for a number of years for reviewing books and, and helping some of my friend authors and academician publish books with your press, um, such as Nikki Taylor published several years ago, America's First Black Socialist, A Radical Life of Peter H. Clark. That's a nice book that I've used in my class. Um, Keith Giffler uh, published a book called Frontline of Freedom, African-Americans um, Forging the Underground Railroad in Ohio Valley. That's one of my areas of studies. I do a lot of work with the Underground Railroad. This particular area is important because, especially in Northern Kentucky, the Underground Railroad is important because at least I, I make the argument and I, I talk about it in some of the, the pieces that I've been working on as being the first interracial, interethnic civil rights movement in the history of the United States that started during the antebellum period, not to diminish the, the modern civil rights movement that started during World War II. But again, the press itself has, has made it one of its mission to focus on the experience of uh, persons of color. It's, it's, not, it's not something they, they did haphazardly. It's a specific intentional uh, perspective that they decided to take on many, many years ago and I applaud them from doing it. So if any of you folks on, um, on the, the um, call have an idea, um, you can talk to me about it. We can kind of fish it out and, and, and see what we can do. So if anybody has ideas about African-American experience, African-American culture, African-American history, especially in Kentucky, um, I'm pretty sure that the press would be open and I, and I can help them to kind of flush out some ideas of book projects or a collection of essays or poetry or music or, or whatever you like, because this particular subject matter is dear to everybody on this call. Sure. And, and while we're while we're sort of waiting for some questions and answers, uh, questions from folks that we that we can answer, let's talk, Eric, a little bit about um, a textbook and then other materials too. So when the when the students were talking earlier this morning, um, they had the question of you know how important is a textbook going to be for you? So one thing that we're working on the press is you know publishing is changing, content is changing, the way that people are getting their information um, is changing as well. So you know we have all of our materials; they're going to be available in print form as well as digital 
digital form too. Um, but when you're in the classroom, a textbook, um, you know, it, it has, it, it lacks that sort of tangible quality that if you're trying to get, I always like to say to authors, um, you know, work for the C student in the back of the room. Don't, don't, you know, really focus your material for, um, you know, the A student who's really going to want to do it. How do you think that we can engage folks, um, as students particularly, in being able to not just have the textbook, but read it and be able to, to you know, really expand on some of those areas that, that we have there? I think the key issues is to we have to envision a different type of educational structure because the structure we have now where we do the um, lecture style and it's in, in person, I think the, the online virtual space of education is here to stay. So we have to reconceptualize how do we get content on this virtual highway? How does that work? How do you engage from a virtual standpoint? Is it chunks of material at 15 minute intervals? Is it some sort of engagement with uh, culture in general, the arts? Um, I think the best way is to, to chunk off information and have more of a, from the African-American perspective, a type of call and response perspective on how do you teach? because it engages the students on a regular basis, which gets us back to this whole concept about how do you conceptualize education? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It's not the traditional, the way it was when we were um, younger. It's, it's a new generation. Sure, sure. I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, working at the press, I feel like we know publishing. Um, but when you're talking into curriculum, you know, that's something that that we want to partner with folks to to figure out how can we take these resources that we have and be able to offer them up freely for, for students and faculty. Um, let me talk a little bit about what open access looks like, um, particularly from a kind of a scholarly standpoint, and then not just how the press is being involved in that, um, but also, you know, many other content providers um, throughout the nation. Um, when we have a lot of material that's going out there, like I mentioned, being able to have it not, not only available for students, but readily accessible. There are a lot of students that are going to want to have this material and teachers as well that, you know, they, they can't fork over 40 and $50 um, for a book, which is really, you know, um, it, it is the, the state of the world that we're living in. So how do we go about that? How do we make sure that we are not just publishing this content, but making it available to the folks who really need it. Um, so for us, we opened up, um, you know, more than 1250 titles. I did include in the in the chat here kind of a link that you can be able to um, sign up for those resources. And please know that we are going to be opening up all of these resources to all public schools in Kentucky throughout the year. Um, so if there are fellow teachers, fellow school systems that do want to have access to this, these materials, please feel free um, to share them um, with anybody within the state of Kentucky. Um, but with that, Eric, I think, you know, going back to what you were saying, it's so important to not just have these digital materials of a textbook that can be long and a little bit arduous for a student to get into too, but resources. Is that videos? Um, is that audio? I agree with you too, you know, keeping it, um, you know, maybe 15 minutes and under, keeping students engaged and the, having them see themselves. Um, and a lot of that is how we're trying to think about taking the written word and making it more engaging um, for both students and teachers too. We're going to be able to do that. Um, and I do have, there's a question um, on, on the panelist side um, of, of students at the university level. All of that is already open access um, to all college students in Kentucky too. So it's, it's an initiative of ours um, to go and make that material for, available at the K through 12 as well. I think one of, one of the, the far reaching conceptualizations that press and, and folks should think about at the press is to figure out how can we make this more digitized in this app world? Like, how do you put content on an app? I'm not, I, it's just, we are all into these apps with iPhones and uh, different types of devices. So how, how do you teach using an app or a Kindle or a smartphone? How does that work? How do you engage students that way? And I'm not just talking typical college students. I mean, we as learners in general, how do we engage the general public through an app? I think if somebody could kind of figure that out and brainstorm 
that aspect with the press of how do you navigate that and, and, and place content on an app that the press would own and mm -hmm. put out content, I think that may be a key also. Yeah, and, and I think um, going off of that, Eric, you know, we are a small nonprofit press. Um, so creating an app is is beyond what we could consider. However, it, you know, this is not the first time, time that we've had this conversation of how do you partner with a, a larger corp corporation or organization to be able to get your material out of there. Um, one way that we've been thinking about it as well is being able to have um, access to enhanced resources. So for example, when you're when you're reading through um, an ebook, and so you have it on your Kindle, that you're going to have links to outside resources. Maybe that's a link to a YouTube clip that you can go to. Maybe that's a link to um, materials that we have on the Filson Historical Society um, to be able to have students really conceptualize this um, in so many ways. You know, some some students are visual learners. They're going to take a be able to read that and, and really integrate it. Others are going to need a little bit more hands on. So I think the more ways that you can have content in a variety of media, um, the more ways that you're going to be able to really make that available too. So, um, you know, let's talk a little bit more about your introduction to study a black studies textbook. Um, how, how do you use resources to be able to um, make that textbook, um, you know, when you're writing it on your side, but also make it engaging um, for for students once they once they have that. Oh, for me, it's 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 about um, content first that you have to tell the entire story. Uh, for example, uh, the good majority of my chapters start off with a type of biographical introduction of a particular individual. It could be um, Angela Davis. It could be some of the founders of Black Studies, um, such as uh, Carter G. Woodson, uh, W. E. B. Du Bois. But it's a biography. I mean, I'm into biographies of, of understanding how folks navigate historically or in a certain time period from one place to the other. Because as has always been told to me, the, the power is in the story. It's how do you tell a good story? And even teaching content, even if you use technology as a historian, there's a story to get your audience hooked into your content. You have to figure out the story because history is more than, as you know, names and dates. That kind of numbs folks' reality with names and dates. You have to have a story. Why, why did these folks um, decide, for example, the Cincinnati 28 that starts off in Boone County, Kentucky and end up in, in um, Hamilton, Ohio or on the north side of Cincinnati? Like, what was their story like? How did they persevere? As I talk about African American history, African American studies, the, one of the main three main themes I focus on is uh, contradiction, struggle, and perseverance. Like how that that's kind of universal concepts for anybody because everybody goes through a contradiction, their struggle in life, but at the end of the day, how do you persevere? So those three concepts kind of is the the linchpin of the textbook and its various manifestations in, in various chapters, if that makes sense. It does. And, you know, when I'm working with authors, I think the the importance of story and narrative is something that comes up really often in the day of, of Wikipedia and, and more information that you could ever read in a lifetime online. How do you take those facts and, you know, just, just wrote data and make it interesting. And I think that's applicable, you know, not just for when you're talking about in the classroom, but just for general readers too. You know, you have a lifelong learners um, who really want to learn about this too, you know, particularly when we're talking about civil rights. Yes, of course, it's important to have it for students, but there's a lot, a lot of folks that, um, you know, need to need to be able to read this and have this in an engaging way too. Um, you know, and so I think that's something that we'll be thinking about more as we get farther along with the publication of your text textbook too is, you know, how can we take some of these stories and make them interesting for our, for our wider market too? You know, how can we make folks um, be really engaged in, in a topic that, uh, you know, has been, has been a difficult one to address both in the classroom and, you know, just in general media as well. The, uh, the other issue for me has to do with empowering folk. I mean, if, if nothing else, and, I, and I've, I've, I've read about, and, and, and as you, uh, talked about my introduction. I've, I've written so much stuff over the years, but for me, it has to do with understanding that education 
as as Frederick Douglass talks about in his, his autobiography is about empowerment, like understanding the written word, you empower yourself because then you can understand your reality based on how you define it. And so if we can kind of communicate that education is not a happenstance, that education is the centerpiece of, of, of how you move from point A to point B, even within a textbook of understanding you're not reading page for page, word for word. How do you take these stories and empower your journey for yourself, in your community, in your state, at this time? Yeah. Um, how, how do we communicate that to the broader audience? Absolutely. We do have a couple questions um, in the Q&A. This one comes from, from Linda. Um, she says, I think projects that use primary source materials, excerpts of pertinent books and work toward podcasts as the final project would be engaging. I think students listen to podcasts like Thoroughline would help them both understand the connection between the past and present and engage them in wanting to learn. Um, Linda, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, when we're thinking about content, um, we're thinking of a multimedia standpoint. So, um, you know, related to this topic, we have a new series called Race and Sports. Um, it is a partnership with Gerald, um, Gerald Smith and Derek White um, at UK. Um, one of the things that we're thinking about when we're bringing authors on is how can they be able to be engaged in multimedia? So that can be podcasts, that can be blogs, um, much in the way that I said, you know, for me, I'm thinking about what is a reader going to be engaged in? And they look at all different forms of content. That might be an audio book, um, you know, that might be a YouTube video. Um, I think that all of those are very relevant um, to students. So it's something that, that we're really thinking about on, on the content side of it. Eric, can you speak a little bit um, when you're working with students? Um, you know, are you bringing in, you know, recommendations for podcasts, um, videos on YouTube, those sorts of those sorts of items? Oh, yes, all the time. I mean, the, the tricky part is the primary sources because you have to get your students engaged in the language of the time. Um, and so the, the language at a particular, in a particular 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, the language becomes the key to navigate, but the primary sources become the key of, of understanding how folks function in a particular time period. So podcast is important. I think um, any technolo technological usage is important, but at the end of the day, at least for me, it has to do with not just content it has to do with skill sets mm -hmm. how do you how do you take those skills that you're learning and those stories that you're articulating how does that learner obtain skill sets through that content what are they learning at the end of the day yeah. um, so so that's that's one of the keys of the textbook of how how do you use that content to build folks skill sets so they can navigate where they need to go in life mm -hmm. And then um, another question that we that we had in the chat as well, going back a little bit, what what about special education and special needs students? Um, I'll answer, you know, thinking from our perspective um, at UPK, this is something that we've been thinking about with readers. You know, often um, it is it's very difficult to be able to open a physical book and be able to engage with that. Um, we are in the process of updating about 500 our books, um, 500 of our books to the newest version of EPUB um, that allows many, much more access um, to to a wide variety of readers. They um, if, if they have issues. With, with sight, they can be able to change the font on those, um, have it read aloud to them. Also, obviously, audio um, is something that's very interested. Um, can you speak to a little bit about that? Of you know how you might change your change your um, educational and your and your content information in the classroom um, for for students that need a little bit more special special needs. I think I, I would rely on my experts to help me in that transition. I mean, uh, to understand that there's different learning styles and, and, and what I need to do to reach all, all students at, at whatever level they need to. But I, I would encourage folks to, to reach out to experts in, in those particular area of special education or gifted students or whatever perspective that needs to be reached. Mm -hmm. um, also backing through some previous questions, I think one, what what folks who are on on this um, particular conference can do is also understand to if they have items and books in their own facilities that they want to donate this historical check out your local libraries or universities or historic societies to to take those items. I mean, I'm, I'm also into historical preservation. I mean, you, you have to understand the past to figure out where you are to, to see where you need to go. 
And if we kind of lose the pass, we, we're kind of lost in, in, in where we need to go in our pathways, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, well, I think we're we're at 1230. Um, so I think we're going to have Frank um, join us here in a second. Eric, any any other items that you wanted to um, address that we haven't discussed here? No, um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think again, thank you and your staff there and, and the press for for what you do and, and keep moving forward. Thank that's that's what we're trying to do. Thank you, Eric. Too, it's been, it's been um, you know lovely working with you, and um, we we do hope to be able to have a lot of partnerships with the with the teachers um, and hopefully some students too when we have the the new textbook coming out. Well, Frank, um, since I already introduced you once, um, you know, we made it a little bit early. Let me do, um, you know, the, the, the 10 cent version. Um, we're very thrilled to have you um, today. You know, obviously you're a fixture, both not, you know, not just on um, the Kentucky scene, but nationally. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Frank did coin the term, uh, term Afrolatcha um, and has really have been um, a figurehead in making um, the profile of, of Blacks within this region known on national stage. Um, I'm also very, very happy to be partnering with him on a couple different projects. Um, obviously, we're very happy to have published two of your poetry collections at the press. Um, you are also have gotten to status that we have a book about you, which um, congratulations, I think that really means that, you, that you've made it. So we're hoping to have that published in 2022. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, um, Frank and I are working with a local illustrator, um, Ron Davis, on an illustrated collection, A is for Afrolatch. And so I think let's start there, um, Frank, of, you know, you're coming at content from a wide variety of ages. So our newest partnership is really geared toward younger, um, a younger audience, one that, you know, might not have ever heard of Blacks um, within the Appalachian region. So um, talk a little bit about how age groups are important to you um, and, then, and then how you're working to kind of make sure that um, individuals at all levels are, are aware of your, um, of, of your topics. Thank you, Ashley. It's good to see you and you too, Eric. And this, that is a great place to start. I think for me, what drives uh, the work is believing that the content has to get out there. Uh, and it makes sense uh, to most people that if you catch young people when they're still young or, or as early as possible, it's easier to get them um, to not just learn the information, but to, to know it, to, to have it and own it in such a way that they be begin to be the distributors of that same information and knowledge. You know, I think that, you know, I'll never forget being in the state of Washington and at a university and someone raised their hand and asked a question, are there other black people in Kentucky other than myself? And I was so stunned by the question, all I could do was laugh and I pretended to be counting all the black people in Kentucky <laughs> and I stopped when they realized it was just a joke. Uh, but it took me a few minutes to understand that they were limited by what they had heard about the state. You know, mass media's perception of the state uh, for them was limited to the movie deliverance, what they believed about the Beverly Hillbillies, Dukes of Hazzard, uh, and whatever they saw on the news. But in most cases, all those images presented a stereotype of, of a homogeneous Kentucky and Appalachian region that was 100% white. And those of us who live in this part of the world know that's just not true. Um, you know, so I've been trying to do battle against those, those master narratives and, and trying to figure out a way to, to get to people in as many places as possible. I, I'm very excited this year to be uh, the author of my first children's book. And I'm looking forward to all the great art that Ron Davis is gonna contribute to it. And it, tries to do the same thing that I've been trying to do. Uh, and I'm thinking about kids of all ages. Um, and I think that you're a kid when you approach a topic that you don't know very much about. And I think I could run down a list of individuals connected to Appalachia that would shock people. Uh, you know, starting with Carter G. Woodson, the father of African-American history. Booker T. Washington, they might get Booker T. Washington, but then they may miss August Wilson, Nina Simone, Angela Davis, Sonia Sanchez, Nikki Giovanni, uh, you know, Jesse Owens. You know, there are so many luminaries that are part of African-American history that I almost never discuss in the same context 
as conversations about Appalachia, that that divide and conquer idea works so successfully that the African American and people of color content in the region almost get disappeared. Mm -hmm. So what I've been doing for 30 years now, and as you know, 2021 is the 30th anniversary for the Appalachian poets, is trying to challenge people's notion and definition of, of what and who are Appalachian and who lives here. Uh, and we've been doing that in as many ways as we can, you know, mostly touring the region, writing books. Uh, many of us are teachers and, you know, try to live in very public spaces like Facebook and, and Instagram and all the new media that I don't know anything about. Uh, but we try to have a very strong presence there. There are about 30 active members uh, that are out there, you know, trying to shake the trees and, and talk to anybody who wants to listen. Uh, mm -hmm and redefine this idea of, of what Kentucky is, you know, what the region is and who's here. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, you know, you know, being a lifelong Kentuckian, um, when I'm going out and really talking about the region, it is, you know, people have misconceptions of, of what the region is and who makes up that. And, you know, you've, you've worked so much with, with a wide variety of folks to trying to, you know, bring um, an accurate depiction of the region and, you know, a, an updated version of, of what we could be. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you've used your poetry and your work to work with students. Um, so you are the director of the MFA program at UK. So I know you're working with a lot of college aid students. Can you talk, um, you know, thinking about how it might be appropriate for, you know, say a high school or middle school audience to, um, how do you bring your poetry in there to really talk about larger issues, um, societal issues and civil rights issues? Sure, uh, I'm gonna need my tech crew on the other end to, to, to support this because I have a couple of links I wanna share. And you know, thanks to the generosity and the hard work of, of teachers whose classrooms I've visited over the years, I've, I have two links that are available that will take you directly to lesson plans you know, for uh, middle school, high school, elementary school age classrooms. Uh, if the tech crew can, uh, let me see if I can even navigate there myself. Uh, if you take this, this page, which is a little blurry for me, that's a little better. Uh, this page lives on the website of Accents Publishing. And I'm sure the link will be available to all of you who are participating and it'll be one click for you. But if you scroll down uh, towards the bottom of the page, Keep going, you know, past these two poems that are part of the book. There's a link there in that first graph of, yes. If you follow this link, it'll take you to uh, a lesson plan uh, that's designed primarily for, it was created for high school and middle school students, but the way it is built, uh, it can be adapted for, for other ages because uh, we understand that you know, some schools have a different idea of what their young people can be exposed to. I once visited a middle school and before I read my poetry, they handed me a list of poems I could not read from my own book because they had been censored. Uh, they thought that they were too adult for their middle school audience uh, because they, they reference uh, drinking or they use uh, profanity uh, or reference intimacy in a way that they wanted to protect their students from. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't even stop to debate that. I understood that they had uh, control of their classroom. They knew their students, but it was kind of a compliment to be on a banned book list. At the same time, you know, this, uh, these lesson plans uh, are things that I, I learned to do while trying to get the books out to classrooms. And in this particular case, I have three books with excuse me, I'm a little bit under the weather, three books with Accents Publishing. And they also have a special arrangement for teachers and schools. If you wanna buy a classroom set, they offer them at a discount. So you could you know, get something uh, close to what the bookstores get. You know, I think bookstores get a 40% off uh, the wholesale cost of, of, of books uh, when they resell them to you. So you don't have to buy them straight off the bookshelf. Nothing against bookstores, but if you buy them, that many books for your classroom, you probably want to get the best deal possible. If we can go to the, 
to the other, uh, other link that's, that lives on the website of the University of Kentucky English Department. Of, we have a, a link in the page just called the Isaac Murphy Everybody Reads Project. And this is something we created um, with teachers around the state, I think in 2010. So it's been up for almost 10 or 11 years and it's still very popular because it has links. If you scroll down uh, this page, We'll open one of these uh, a little further. Okay, let's stop there for a second. Uh, this first one under high school uh, is a link that was developed by Philip Schlick uh, when she taught at Taste Creek High School. And inside the link, uh, you get five different lessons uh, that deal with poetry, uh, that deal with poetic language, that deal with writing poetry, of, you know, Phyllis has won awards for her teaching style. You know, some of her students have ended up in my classrooms at the University of Kentucky. So if you scroll this, you can see that she has the common core standards all listed out for every single step of, maybe it's not as fuzzy for you. Oh, there it is, it gets clear when you wait, pause a second. Uh, if you keep scrolling, we just walk through what's here. Uh, yeah, that's a good pace, just keep scrolling. To the next page, please. Uh, you see there are more core standards. Uh, slow down. Uh, and this is the, the first lesson, you know, and she already told you what you would get from this. And depending on what you want to use in your classroom, uh, you, know, you can start with something as simple as building a vocabulary for poetry. So you can teach students how to talk about poetry, you know, which is something that makes it less intimidating for them because most students, by the time you get them into high school, are so intimidated by poetry, especially if their first introduction was through a Shakespearean sonnet, that they believe poetry is not for them. And what I focused on over the year, years is trying to have work that students and teachers thought was accessible, uh, that spoke not only directly to them, that spoke about things that they could relate to. So when you look at kind of the general themes of family, identity, place, social justice, and, and history. Uh, you could put all 11 of my collections in those categories and almost all of them, uh, I think students could connect with. You know, there's one, one whole lesson about imagery from art. Uh, you know, the, all of these lessons that Phyllis has built are all connected uh, to the book about Isaac Murphy. And, you know, Isaac Murphy is one of our more important historical figures uh, in Kentucky history, not just African-American, but in Kentucky history. And one of the things I think Lexington does poorly is that we don't celebrate Isaac Murphy in the same way that Louisville celebrates Muhammad Ali. I mean, you know, we need an Isaac Murphy museum that allows us to talk about all the horse racing uh, occupations and all the people in the East End who were part of this important history. You know, one of the things that we experience when those kids see the Kentucky Derby for the first time on television is they don't see the history. They don't see all those African-American writers that dominated horse racing back at its beginnings. And so these kinds of books um, allow that to change. These particular lesson plans aren't limited to my book about Isaac Murphy. Uh, Patsy Trollinger also has a children's book uh, that we use in these lesson plans so that we can reach uh, you know, the youngest readers. You know, so these, these plans are designed um, you know, if we go back out and click on the next link, you know, Phyllis has five lessons here. Uh, go down to a middle school link to um, the first one, poetry analysis template. Uh, you know, these were done by Willow Hambrick, uh, who teaches in, excuse me, in Georgetown. And, you know, she has, has taken the time to create you know, very interesting and useful things that are targeted at middle school, which is her expertise. Uh, if you scroll through that, you know, you'll see that she also has quite a few op options for you uh, to allow kids to get a chance to think about what they just read and, and to think about what's on the page. I think there might be 12 or maybe 10 questions in a row uh, if you keep scrolling. Uh, they go into detail about what you might find on the page and how to approach it. We'll just keep scrolling and see those. 
of if you, if you click back out, you'll see that that's just one of about five different sets of, of options you have under, under middle school alone. And if you click on the, the one on the elementary, which features Patsy Trollinger's uh, children's book, uh, you know, you'll see a lot of uh, work that includes uh, art lessons. You know, there's a chance in this, this set of lessons for you to design your own silks. Uh, there are lessons here to deal with music. There are links that bring in other information uh, that's available on the net. Uh, so it becomes interactive and young people seem to learn better uh, when you feel like they're watching television. Uh, so you bring in music, you bring in video, you bring in uh, as many things as possible. Although none of those can substitute for having the writer and poet themselves live in your classroom. Um, so I wanted to make sure I shared this with you and they've been up for a while. Some people have known about them, but they're out there and they're available. And it's also something that I think more presses would do if, if, if asked. I think that when we first started putting our books on the market, we didn't think about lesson plans. And it wasn't until I started visiting more schools and teachers asked me, you know, if I had a lesson plan to accompany that particular book that I realized that we could do a better job serving our, that audience. Um, so I encourage all writers out there, I encourage all teachers who want to bring writers and poets into your classroom, ask them or ask the press themselves, is there a lesson plan or a set of plans for your particular grade level that accompanies that particular book? And I guarantee they won't regret uh, how easy it is to move classroom sets of books now that somebody has done most of the work for you. Uh, so I hope that's useful for you and I'm sure that you'll be able to get those links and again, one's at Accents Publishing's website and the other's at the University of Kentucky English Department's website under Everybody Reads. I think that all sounds um, terrific, Greg. And I think that they're working on a getting a link for everybody in, in the chat right now. And then we're gonna be having follow-up resources um, follow our, our mission today. Um, Frank, I, I really, I, you know, when we're talking about having extra materials, from a from a publication site and from a content site, um, you know, ten years ago when we were working on you know different books, we didn't really have the resources to be able to post that kind of materials. It's a different ball game these days. Um, you know, that is one thing that we're thinking about doing on open access. Um, you know, resources. Obviously, you know, you've done a fantastic job um, with that. I think having the Kentucky Teaching Standards makes it so relevant um, to many of the teachers that we have here. Um, when when you're talking. Um, you know, with with students in general, um, you talked a little bit about how, you know, Kentucky really isn't known um, for having a diverse background. Why that might not, might not be the case. Um, is that something that you work with students on their poetry as well? Or do you try to kind of let them have their own voice when they're working on that? Oh, absolutely. I let them have their own voice. You know, I think that uh, each of them have a story, you know, regardless of what their, uh, their personal life evolves out of and comes from. And I want them to, to tell their story. You know, I think that, you know, we all have our own unique experience. And even though people like to talk a lot about this idea of universality, uh, it seems to be more useful if people just try to find their story. You know, most mm -hmm. young writers begin writing what I think is from the navel, you know, writing about everything they know, everything that they own as far as the personal information. And eventually they get bored with that. Um, my hope is that at some point they recognize that there's so many things that have not been written about uh, that they move in other directions. And for me, that's where my collection of persona poems have come from. You know, I have four collections that deal with history, that deal specifically with Isaac Murphy, that deal with the Lewis and Clark expedition. You know, those are the two uh, collections that I have with, you know, UPK. Uh, Buffalo Dance and When Winter Come that talk about the Lewis and Clark expedition in a way that I didn't learn in school. When I grew up in school, I thought that Lewis and Clark were two white male superheroes and they conducted the entire expedition all by themselves, only to find out as an adult that there were 42 people, including a 15 year old Native American young woman and an African American man from Kentucky who were along on the expedition. And that changed everything for me. So I wanted to relook at that story in a way that forced people uh, to broaden 
the preconceptions about everything, particularly history, especially when history may not really be history. It just may be one person's point of view presented as history. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. You know, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, the York collections. We do have a question um, from Jared in the Q&A. Um, he says, Frank, I really love your, your, your York poems. Um, do we have teaching materials that employ those? And I think that's something that maybe you and I could have a, a separate conversation about um, as well is how we can host some of those um, at the press as well. Right. And what I found out is the best way to get those is to find, try to find the teachers who've already been using those texts in the classrooms. In most cases, they have uh, lesson plans that they love to share. Um, you know, so we could do a call for any schools or teachers using those or encourage those teachers to do this, you know, create them and share them with everybody else because they, they are useful. Um, and of course, the easiest thing on our end, of course, is to is sit down and write them uh, in conjunction with some teachers at every level and then put them up on the website so that you don't have to worry about printing them. Uh, mm -hmm. They're always available 24 seven and anybody can have access, that free access to another part of our education. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that is exactly what we're trying to do, um, you know, on the publication side of it too, not just at Kentucky, but um, beyond. I attend a lot of the university press, um, you know, director listservs. And that's really thinking about it, you know, how not only do you have digital materials for your books, but digital content um, so that you can use it in whatever way might be best for us. So we have about six minutes left, Frank. Is there anything um, that we've left off here that you'd like to, to bring up or we do have some time for Q and A's as well? Uh, let's, let's take some questions. Uh, and if there's no questions, I, I can close with a poem from one of the collections that deal with history. Okay, we'll give um, we'll give a second to have any questions in there. Um, and just to kind of wrap up on on my end, if anyone has any questions about the university press, you know, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, we are very privileged to be in partnership with the Clark Foundation, who is today's sponsor. Um, the Clark Foundation is really dedicated not just to Kentucky history, but um, history of diverse voices within the region too. Um, so if there's anything um, that I can answer for you, please let me know. I do hope that um, everyone does take us up on our open access materials. Um, as you know, is, is evident in this conversation, there's a lot of material that we have for our backlist that's available, um, but we do anticipate, you know, having a lot more resources um, directly related um, to teaching within the school systems um, related to that too. So um, no questions on here, Frank. So let's, um, let's open it up to, to your poem. Okay, I'll, I'll close with this poem from um, Isaac Murphy. It's the final poem in the collection and it's called uh, Praise Song that comes out of the tradition of of uh, the African griot, where to, to, to memorialize a significant historical figure, you know, the griot creates for them a praise song. This is praise song for Isaac Murphy. Straddling the distance between African Cemetery Number no. Two and the Kentucky Horse Park, between the straw line stables at Churchill Downs and the view for Millionaire's Row between our racist history and our proud past, I offer these words, this elegy, this praise song for Isaac, for every master teacher blessed with a willing student, for Jimmy Wingfield and William Walker, Pat Day and Calvin Borrell, Eddie Arcaro and Angel Cordero Jr., for every jockey hypnotized by the speed, power, and the music of racing, for every trainer, groom, hot walker, and stable hand who palmed a brush carried a bucket or lifted a shovel. For every Derby Day hero, generous enough to take a jockey along for the ride. For every yearling dreaming of a garland of roses, for every also ran. I commit this husband to his wife, this son to his mother, this student to his teacher. I offer all of them to each of us. I dedicate this ride to a man whose life's work was a blueprint for anyone, black, white, or brown, hoping to build something better, hoping to fulfill their own potential, to use all their gifts and blessings in an honorable way. Isaac Murphy's life teaches us how to honor our parents, how to love full speed, how to outrun prejudice and oppression. I dedicate this ride to America and Kentucky, son, to a legacy worthy of a star on the walk, a boulevard named in his honor, this book, Wrap your arms around his story. Close your eyes. Feel the wind whispering in your own ears. 
Grab the reins of any and everything that makes your heart race. Find your purpose. Find your purpose and hold on. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks, Frank. That was beautiful. I appreciate talking with you. Thanks, everybody.